take our Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter number 2. Genesis chapter number 2. So tonight's lesson, as we're talking about uh, the home, is the first marriage. We're going to look at the first marriage in the Bible and Find some things in there that will be helpful. In Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 18, we begin there. We'll read through the end of the chapter. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature... That was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found in help meat for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Let's pray. Father, do thank you for your word and just... The truths that we find here, I ask that as we study the home this year and in our institute time, that it would be a help, it would be a blessing as we go through systematically looking at different um, facets of the family. And we pray now as we look at marriage that uh, we'll we'll glean some, some wonderful truths from this first marriage. Lord, give me wisdom, strength, and uh, clarity of mind. I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and teach us some things. Lord, may we walk away from here not just saying those are some good ideas, but maybe find some truths that we need to apply to our lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So the account of Adam and Eve uh, provides a whole lot more than just the account of the fall of mankind. A lot of times when we think of Adam and Eve, we go back to the fall of mankind. But it teaches some wonderful principles, from very foundational principles of marriage. So as we look at Adam and Eve this evening, I want to look at it in light of marriage. So let's learn some practical lessons from the very first marriage. Number one, if you have your outlines, and if you don't have your outlines, it's still number one. The purpose of marriage. The purpose of marriage. We find some different things here in, in, in the uh, passages here. In, in the first purpose is to, fulf- is to fulfill God's plan. You see, God had a plan in marriage. It's not just about uh, me having a wife or my wife having a husband. It's, and it wasn't about just trying to take care of Adam. That, that's part of it. But God had a plan in it. So I want to just look at some things. Some of it might be a little bit of, of a review from some of the things that Pastor Dameron mentioned last week. But the, the first thing we see about uh, to fulfilling God's plan is that he commenced marriage. God began it. It was God who who did this in verse 21. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man, and he slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made a woman, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And so God's the one who started marriage. So marriage has a sacred author, and that makes it a sacred institution. And we have a sacred manual that we should follow in this thing of marriage. To the extent that people follow the Bible, they will have a good marriage. It's just simple. Even unsaved people, to the extent that they follow it, some of them don't even know they're following biblical principles, but as they do, it helps their marriage. And so, 
you know, God is the one who began. He commenced marriage. And secondly, we see that he clarified marriage. Marriage, we find there in verse 22, is between one man and one woman. I'm not going to belabor the point, but just point out a couple of things here. In verse 22, it says, And the rib which the Lord God took, had, made from, uh, had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. God brought one woman to one man. It's pretty simple. Okay? That means there's no homosexual unions. God gave one woman to one man. He brought her unto the man. And in verse 24, it says that, she, that, that he shall cleave to, unto his wife. So God created, as you all know, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. So there's no homosexual unions. There's no child unions. This is a, a creepy thing that's coming up in, 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 our, in our world. The first marriage was between an adult male and an adult, adult female. That's why God used the terms man and woman. Right? So the Lord, the, the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. No child unions. And then the next thing we see out of this is no polygamous unions. Okay? Verse 22 implies that, that, um, that men are only to have, a man is only supposed to have a one wife, singular. You look at there in verse 22 that uses the word her and, and wife. That's in the singular, not in the plural. And so God did not give multiple wives to Adam. Polygamy was never God's plan. It just never was. There's, there's some societies, there's some uh, uh, you know, cultures that, that think it's okay, and it's not. Polygamy is a very selfish, and it's a very chauvinistic practice. I mean, you will see uh, men with many wives, but you don't see many women with many husbands. It's a chauvinistic, selfish practice. It's an unbiblical practice. So we see this is it's, the purpose of marriage is to fulfill God's plan. He commenced marriage. He clarified marriage. And then uh, we see that he, he made the choice in marriage. He chose marriage. In verse 22, you see that God chose the wife for Adam. He prepared her and he brought her unto the man. You young single guys, that should be helpful to you. <laughs> that God is working to prepare a young lady for you, and when he's ready, he will bring her to you. And Adam accepted the one that God had prepared for him. You know, can I tell you, God knows who is best for you. God knows what you need more than you do. And God knows who's, you know, he knows who's best for each other. So if you're single... Just rest assured, God's going to take care of it in his timing, if he wants you to get married. Adam and Eve did not have time, think about this, to fall in love. They simply decided to love one another. Can I say this? Love is more than an attraction. It's more than a feeling. Love is a decision. And I believe that Adam and Eve, it, it bears this out. I've counseled people over the years on, on several occasions, people who have said, I'm not really sure I loved him or her when we got married. That's a lame excuse. Why'd you get married? Maybe because you did love each other. And if you don't, if you really come down, well, I didn't. Then love them now. It's a decision. Adam and Eve, they just, he, here's this woman. He's like, okay. Love her. And I'm not saying you single guys just go find some woman and say, hey, I'm marrying you. No, remember, God will prepare her and bring her to you. And, you know, God's will praying and all that works it all out. Okay. <laughs> so. God made the choice in marriage. And if you're married, you're married. Amen? Love each other. It'll work. All right, so the purpose of marriage, first of all, is to fulfill God's plan. Secondly, is to fulfill, fulfill man's needs. Verse 18, 
The Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be what? Alone. Husband and wife are supposed to be together. And that's, you know, it's like, you're really coming up with some deep stuff for a little. Yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm deep, right? They should not be apart for long periods of time. In the course of my ministry, I've, I've had to counsel people who were, who were trying to, you know, maintain jobs, two different jobs in far distant areas, and they weren't together. And I said, this is not going to work. You shouldn't do this. And inevitably, I hated to be the prophet, but it didn't work. Why? Because it's good for the man not to be alone. The, the, the wife is created to be a helper to the man. That's found there in, in the end of verse 20. He, he was looking at the field, and there was not found and help meet for him. There wasn't nothing there fit for him. So in the rest of creation... Now, ladies, I should encourage you. Creation didn't seem to be complete until the woman was created. Right? Some would say, yeah, he saved the best till last, right? <laughs> he created both the man and the woman, and that means that both are important. And guys, why did God create a, hel a, a helper for Adam? Because he needed help. I've got news for every one of us men. We need help. You might not be the man you think you are. You might be a man, but, you know, because you're a man, you're part helpless. Just ask your wife. <laughs> every man should learn to talk to his wife about important issues, about every issue in the family, raising the children, but I'm the man. I make the decisions. Yes, you're the man and you make the decisions, but you need help raising those children. Say, well, I, I control the money. Well, she might do a better job of uh, helping manage the money. Well, why don't you talk to her about it? She might have some good ideas. In fact, she will have some good ideas. The daily schedules, the problems with the neighbors, all of these things, she's going to have good ideas. And men, God gave us a wife to help us, so let her help. Let her help. Listen to her input. Be approachable. I say, oh, you just said listen to your wife? Wilson, you listen to your wife? Yeah. Now, there's a difference between listening and obeying. <laughs> I listen. I take the input. And all the good ideas I keep. And if there happens to be a bad one, it just kind of sifts through, right? And then I make the decision, because God made me the leader in the home. But I'm, 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 I'm really silly not to listen to her. I remember a <laughs> deputation years ago. We were driving down the road, and she was like, I think you should get off at this exit. <laughs> it's like, no, we're not getting off at this exit. We're not getting off. We don't need it. So she just shut up the rest of the time. And I'm just driving and driving and driving and driving. And we were way down the road, and I realized... We should have got off of that exit. <laughs> I should have listened, not obeyed, but I should have listened to my wife. She had good input. She was helping me. Oh, yeah. But you know what happens sometimes in husbands and wives? That the husband gets tired of listening to his wife. And sometimes the wife doesn't approach it the right way. And there's contention and there's friction, and then you stop talking to each other. Not a good marriage. Man, you have needs. Work together so that you can have your needs met. And many marriages in our society end because the wife's not around and, or the wife's not fulfilling her role or he doesn't want her to fulfill a role and it's kind of gone sour. And so what happens? He finds another woman to meet his needs. That happens all the time. And it doesn't have to. So the purpose of marriage is to... Uh, to fulfill God's plan, to fulfill man's needs, and thirdly, to fulfill woman's needs. You know, she's part of creation, and she has needs also. And she's made from the man, so she needs him. And God brought her unto the man so that he would take care of her. Guys, a wife is not a slave. She is someone that you're supposed to take care of. God gave you a wife Yes, to help you, but also so that you can help her 
and that you can be responsible for her. Eve became Adam's responsibility, and nobody else was there to meet her needs. And you've got to be there to meet her needs. You come home from work, and she wants to talk, and you're tired from work, and you want to put your feet up and read the paper or whatever you do, and you don't have time. She's got all the problems with the neighbors, all the problems from the house, all the problems from the kids, and she wants to talk, and you're like, oh, man, can, we, can you just get off my back? You know, she's got needs. Help her. Now, I, I listed a few of the needs here um, that a wife uh, has some needs. We've seen uh, from Adam and Eve here. Uh, number one is that she needs authority. We find this in chapter 3, verse 16. This is, of course, after sh they had sinned. God's bringing judgment unto the woman. He said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Okay? That's what God said. She a wife needs an authority, she, and she has an authority. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. It doesn't mean Adam's more important. doesn't mean that he's more spiritual. He was just first formed, and this was the order that God had. Uh, Adam, after Adam and Eve sinned, they hid themselves, right? And when God went looking for them, who did he address? Hey, Eve, where are you? No. He was calling out to Adam, verse, chapter 3, verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Not where are ye. Where are you, bud? Why? Because with authority comes accountability. My wife likes it that I'm the authority, that I make the decisions with, the, with, with things like with the finances and stuff because then she doesn't, have, she doesn't have to worry about it. There's no accountability. Just, yep, you can make the decisions. And that's good. And that's good. So the wife is going to give account too, obviously in chapter 3, verse 13, God was trying to hold her accountable, but he's going to hold the husband primarily accountable for the decisions in the marriage. Secondly, we see provision. Another need that she has is provision. Chapter 2, verse number 15, we go back there. Chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Whose job was it to take care of the garden? Adam's. That means man is supposed to provide for his family. The wife, need, uh, you know, the wife needs a man to provide for her needs. It gets really backwards and turned around when the wife becomes the breadwinner. That's not how God designed it. You say, well, should a wife work? Is it okay for her to work? You'll have to come back next week for the lesson there. But in chapter 3, verse 17 through 19, we see something else. It says, And unto Adam, he said, this is God after the judgment here, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree which I, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat uh, the herb of the field in the sweat of thy face. Shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground? For out of it wast thou taken, and, uh, and for, the, for dust thou art, and unto the dust shalt thou return. So Adam was one in the field working to provide food for the family. And the wife is not the provider. She's supposed to be provided for. Then we see another need, number three, would be protection. Now, I'm going to jump over to the New Testament quickly, and we'll come back here in 1 uh, Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, of the two, the wife, the Bible says, is the weaker vessel. Now, I know there's some pretty powerful women out there, but uh, typically... 
the wife is weaker physically and emotionally. You say, don't say that. But it's true, so you just have to get over it if you don't agree with it. Uh, it's the husband's job, yes, to protect her fi uh, physically, but he's also prote protect her um, emotionally and spiritually and protect her from bad influences. Now, as we get back to Adam and Eve, remember the devil had appealed to Eve's emotions saying, you shall be as gods knowing good and evil, right? Eve had needed some protection from the devil. And it's the, the husband's duty, it's his responsibility um, to realize that his wife is going to be tempted by the devil's crowd, by the world. Guys, don't put your head in the sand and think your wife's not going to be influenced by the world, the worldly pressures. And other times, a husband has to protect his wife from an overloaded schedule. She thinks she can do everything. And then she's doing great, and then she just melts and has a meltdown and just can't handle it anymore. Why? Because she's the weaker vessel. And so the husband has to come in sometimes and, and overrule or at least regulate and help her handle her schedule and not to pile too much on her himself. All right, so she needs um, protection. And fourthly, she needs honor. Husbands are clearly to taught, uh, taught to treat their wives with respect. Again, we'll, some of this we'll touch a little bit next week, too, in a different angle. But again, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now, because she's weaker, weaker doesn't mean worse. It just means different. So she's more fragile. She requires extra care. Now, guys, if you ever, ever helped your wife carry some groceries in, I remember as a boy, mom saying, be careful with that bag. That bag has eggs in it. I always knew. You just be careful with the, bag, the egg bag, you know? And so I, to this day, I'm going to handle the bag with a bunch of tin cans a lot differently than I'm going to handle the bag that has a couple dozen eggs in it. And if you don't, you're going to find out that you probably should have. So the eggs are more fragile, the eggs are weaker, and so I'm going to be more careful, and I'm going to be more gentle, and I'm going to be more tender. Guys, that's how we ought to be with our wives. That's a need that she has. She needs that kind of respect, that kind of honor. Don't be rough with the weaker vessels. Treat her with extra care because she's weak. But people tend to stomp on them and and, and well, she's weaker, and we push people down who are who are we think are under us. No, that's not God's way. We like the verse, men, that says, you know, that the wife's supposed to reverence the husband. But we must not forget that one of her needs is to be treated with dignity, also. And did on Adam honor his wife? Yes, he did. Look in chapter verse, uh, chapter two, verse twenty-three. It says, and Adam said. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of my man. Uh, out of man. Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. He esteemed her highly because she was part of him. And that goes along with Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He recognized that she was from him. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man yet... Uh, ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth. So he treated her as his own body. So not only was he showing honor and respect and dignity, but he was also showing love. Interesting, if you look through this passage, you're not going to find the word love until you get where um, uh, Jacob uh, has love for, um, for Rachel. You're not going to find it in there until you get there. That's the first time it's mentioned. So you say, well, there was no love in Adam and Eve's marriage? I didn't say that. I believe there was. I believe, this, I believe this verse right here is proof that there was. Okay? Adam loved her and cherished her and realized that she was bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And what does the scripture say? No man ever yet hated his own flesh. So he was taking care of her like he took care of himself. So according to Ephesians chapter 5, do you think that means that he loved her? Yes. <laughs> yes, of course he did. All right. Glad we're all excited tonight. <laughs> a 
Men, don't treat your wives like dirt. Treat them with dignity. That's what we need to remember. And many husbands are self-centered. They focus on their own needs and they neglect the needs of their wife. And we need to remember that, that the purpose of marriage is to fulfill God's plan. So if you're going to have marriage, do it God's way. Don't rush ahead and try to you know, shack up and do all those other stuff stupid things, sinful things, wicked things, evil things. Fulfill God's plan, do it his way, and fulfill and remember that man has needs and the woman needs has needs. So I've gotten through my first point. Let's get to number 2. The plan of marriage. The plan of marriage. Oh, we find this here in verse number 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So the plan of marriage, quite simple. First of all, leave your family. That's it. That's pretty simple, right? A man and a woman leave their old families and they make a new family. All right? I see John down there. I don't know if anyone will ever want to marry him. But if he finds someone who will want to marry him, he will leave my home. I'm over here. And he's going to leave my home, he's going to go over there, and some woman's going to leave her home, and she's going to go over there. And now, he's not in my family, and she's not in her family. They've got a new family. I can't say, hey, son, well, you know, I can't boss him around anymore. It's hard to do that now. And her, mo her mom and dad can't tell her what to do anymore. Why? Because she's got a new head. There's a new family. And this is really important because the wife is now more important than the man's parents and the children are more important than brothers and sisters. An extended family is not your main family. And once you're married, you got a new family. And parents don't tell their kids, married kids, what to do. Do a, a couple. You say, this, I've got lots of stories from Africa, but I've got, this, this one's from America. A young couple moved in with a with the wife's parents, I think it was the idea was to help save money as they, as they were getting started out. And uh, they got married. They, they moved in there. And after a while, for no good reason, the parents kicked the young man out of their home and kept the daughter. <laughs> and, and the young man went back to his parents' home. And they were still married, but not together. Now, to top it all off, the parent, the guy who did that, he was a pastor. Oh, man, I heard that story, and I was livid. I said, that, that man is destroying that marriage. It's terrible. The idea of a woman going home to her parents is wrong. It's unbiblical. Now, I understand, you know, if her life's in danger and she needs to get out of a dangerous situation, I understand I, but Eve had nowhere to go. She had no mother and father to return to, and God made it that way. It's not God's plan for married people to return to their old family. Okay, let's move on. Um, so letter A would be uh, leave your family, and letter B is cleave to each other. Now, this speaks of oneness and unity. The old leave and cleave, right? Uh, the Bible says that two become one. You're no longer two. If you're married, you're one. So, and verse, Mark chapter 10, verse 8 says it this way, and they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain, that means no more two, but one flesh. So God considers a married couple to be one. Because they're one, they're not supposed to be separated. So if we, um, if we take a book and just start ripping pages out of this, I'm not going to do that, but uh, just... Make a good illustration, though, right? So if I start ripping the pages out of some chapters out of a book, you no longer have a complete book, and the part that was just ripped out, that's incomplete, too. Why? Because when it's all together, it's a book. And when you start taking and, and, and ripping half of it out and trying to separate, it's not a book anymore. Neither one is complete. That's why we need to get married and stay married and cleave to each other. When you stop cleaving, you got problems. So 
how can someone be separate from each other when you're supposed to be one with each other? It, it doesn't work that way. Husband and wife are to hold on to each other and to never let go. Is that what the, is that what the first marriage teaches? I think it's pretty clear. And they should not be trying to get rid of each other because of problems in the marriage. And uh, you're to live dependent on each other. Marriage should never consist of two people living independently of each other, just kind of residing in the same house. Legally married, but no oneness, no unity, no cleaving. There's just not a good situation. You should share your burden, share your plans, your desires, your dreams, and your problems, and help one another. And the Bible stresses oneness. They were called, look in chapter two, 5, verse number 2. They were called one name. Look in, in chapter 5, verse 2. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name, their is plural, their name Adam in the day when they were created. That's kind of why even in our society, when a couple gets married, the wife takes the man's last name. I know it doesn't happen a lot anymore. It still happens, but it's not as prevalent as it's common. But that, there's a biblical reason why we have done that over the years. All right, so let me get to the third point. Number three, the propriety of marriage. The propriety of marriage. Let me say a couple things here. First one is this. Intimacy is reserved for marriage. And you say, oh, you use that word. Well, if intimacy is, bothers you, then you, we can repronounce it, you know, intimacy. I don't know if that helps you. Does that, does that make it better? Okay, we'll just talk about intimacy tonight. Uh, now, listen, I'm not going to be inappropriate. Why would I do that? Um, that? The whole point is the propriety of marriage, right? If it's acceptable to condemn unlawful intimacy, like when we preach against adultery and fornication, no one's sitting here squirming when I say you shouldn't commit adultery and fornication. Then, then why would it be unacceptable to speak favorably of lawful intimacy in the confines of marriage? And again, I'm not going into any detail. I'm just we, we condemn the wrong, but we never say that the right is okay. So couples who don't hug each other, just think with me. You don't even embrace. I mean, it's, it's a rare occasion you'll even embrace each other. You're not cleaving very well. You say, well, you're just stretching. I am not stretching it. Okay? Cleaving and becoming one flesh, and without going into, has intimate implications. I know that from 1 Corinthians 6, 16, when Paul said, what? Know ye not what? That, that he which is joined to an harlot is one body. That's talking about, you know, Physical intimacy, he says, for two saith he shall be one flesh. So he's, he's going back and he's referencing the Genesis account and he's saying that this illicit intimacy um, is, 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 is joining together, he's, and which ought not to be. So certainly this idea of becoming one flesh and leaving and cleaving, all that, it does include this. And when a husband and wife don't have a right relationship in that way, there's something wrong. You're not fulfilling God's command of leaving and cleaving. Husband and wife aren't supposed to deprive each other of, of, uh, of affection. The Bible says, defraud, not, defraud you not one another, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves unto fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency first. Corinthians 7, 5. So God's des design is clear. All such activity is for married people. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. And we live in a very promiscuous society and all the engaged in sexual activity outside of marriage, the Bible says, will be judged. You will be judged. So well, I've gotten away with it. You will be judged. Because God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That includes fornication. It includes adultery. You know, in this wicked, sick world that we're living, it, it includes, that, you know, that, that, that talks about bestiality too. I mean, Paul talked about it in Romans chapter 1. 
right? After Adam, after God, you know, made all the beasts of the field and, he, and Adam looks at them and names them, the Bible says there was not found in help meat for him. Pretty simple right there. The very first marriage teaches. It's one man, one woman, and that's it. Anything outside of that, any kind of relationship, physical relationship outside of that is wrong and it's usually wicked and sick and, and whacked out. Following the Bible eliminates a lot of strange, sordid lifestyles. All right, so we got that part. Then, uh, so intimacy is reserved for marriage. Then we see nakedness is reserved for marriage. Verse chapter two, verse twenty-five says, "And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not and were not ashamed." Now, unfortunately, today, many people have lost their shame regarding nakedness. Uh, nobody should ever see your nakedness except your spouse. Period. Put it down, that's it. That means, you know, people, you know, you, you see these, these couples walking down the, the road, he, he's got his arm around her and she's like half dressed. That's for, if he's, that's his wife, that's for him, not for everybody else. You don't flaunt your nakedness outside the home by wearing immodest clothing. You know what else? It also means you don't, that you're very careful to be modest in your home around your children. It's not right for your children to see your nakedness. You know, some people are just far too casual at home. If you wouldn't wear it out in public, and it's not appropriate and modest out in public, then it's not appropriate and not modest for your family at home, for your kids to see. Now, the Bible teaches this idea in Leviticus chapter 18, verses 6 and 7. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him, uh, to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. Thy, the nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. So God expects modesty and modest dressing, even in the family unit. First Timothy 2.9, still in the Bible. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. As a reminder, that word modest refers to a long flowing garment. That's what the word modest by definition is. Long, flowing. You know what that means, ladies? Long and loose. Make sure your skirts and dresses are long enough and loose enough. We don't, we don't need hip huggers. We don't need hug and tug type of skirts. You know, the hug and tug, you, they, they, they hug too tight. That's not good. And if you got to sit down and you got to keep tugging at, at your thing to cover your knees, they're probably a little too short. Just if it don't pass the hug and tug test, then get some real skirts and dresses. So when God clothed Adam and Eve, he made coats of skin. And coats are long, and they completely covered their nakedness. And it's also important to note that Adam and Eve, they were clothed before they had kids. Okay? In other words, be careful how you lounge around in your home. You say, well, I shouldn't have to say that. Shouldn't have to say that, but some people have no idea. And this is what the first marriage teaches. Number four, we see the problems in marriage. I'll give you these quickly. Adam and Eve had a good start. Oh, yeah, but they ran into some problems. <laughs> and some people, they get married, and they got a great start, and then they realize, oh. <laughs> so a couple things. First of all, um, letter A, if you're taking those notes, we see the source of problems. The source of problems, the source of problems is sin. You got two sinners coming together. Every husband, every wife have a sin nature, and we all have a free will, and sometimes we use that free will to choose the wrong things. And so just as we help one another, uh, we can also hurt one another, and that's not good, but it happens. And sin damages our relationships. And so not only was Adam and Eve, temp uh, was, was Eve tempted, but she also tempted her husband with the fruit. She wasn't helping him. And we got to be very careful that our influence doesn't take our family down the wrong road. We don't tempt each other and, or encourage each other to, to listen to the wrong music, to watch the wrong kind of videos, to dress immodestly, to all those things. Don't provoke each other. Anyway, let's move quickly to the next one. Sam, uh, we see a sampling of problems. What are some of the problems? The first marriage, if we studied it, 
you know, it doesn't provide us with all the problems that marriages have, but it does show us some common ones. First one, number one, is that Satan will attack. We find that in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. I've given you those uh, verses. You can go and look at that. Okay? He may initially attack through the weaker vessel. That's how he attacked. He got Adam through Eve. He uses deception. He uh, appeals to the senses, all of those things. Then the second thing and the second problem we can see in marriages is that women try to lead. Not all women and not all the time, but women do try to lead. The Bible says in Genesis 3, 6, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So there will always be problems when the wife leads the home. Husband says, well, she's better at leading. No, you lead. God gave her to you because she's got, she can help you. If she's right with God, she'll have some good ideas. And you listen to those and you, you, you process those and, and you make the right decisions. Okay, number three, men foolishly follow. Not, not all men, but men who do follow. It's wrong. And unto and Genesis 3, 17, and unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened, this is why he got judged, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of the which I have commanded thee, saying thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. So Adam was punished because he followed and listened and followed his wife. He knew better. God already told him what to do, but he did what he wanted to do regardless of what God had said. And when a man knows something's wrong, he shouldn't follow his wife's advice. It's pretty simple. So men, as the Lord was not happy with Adam for following his wife into disobedience, he's not going to be pleased when we follow our wives down the wrong path. So it's the husband's job to lead, not to follow, right? Ephesians 5, 23, the husband is the head of the wife. I know I'm moving quickly. That's okay. Number four, couples lose God's presence. See, the fellowship with God uh, was replaced in Adam and Eve's life. They got into sin, and now they lost that sweet fellowship. Next thing, we see them withdrawing. We see them in fear. We see them in shame. We find that in chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. They're hiding. They're in fear. They're, they're, and they've lost that sweet fellowship with God. And married couples live a very shallow uh, existence together when they're living in sin. You got two, two couple, uh, you, you know, a husband and wife, they're both in the flesh and they're not working on their problems. They're not in fellowship with God. They're not in fellowship with each other. It's just a blah existence. So take care of just doing what you're supposed to be doing in the marriage and it'll really sort a lot of things out with your relationship with God. You'll never be happy when there's sin in your marriage. Well, there's lust, jealousy, Bitterness, antagonism, anger, whatever it is, it all will rob you of God's presence. Then number five, another problem is excuses are made in chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, right? And he said unto, in verse 11, and he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the, of the tree whereof I commanded that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Oh, yeah. Men... When you make a decision, it's your responsibility. And so he's blaming his wife. She gave it to me. And then actually, actually, he was blaming God. You gave this woman to me. He was blaming everybody, but he wasn't taking account. And so he was making excuses. And we can't blame our wives for the decisions that we make. And of course, Eve made excuses too. And a lot of times, when I'm counseling um, people who... Couples are having marriage problems. It's always, they're just pointing fingers and blaming each other. Just blaming each other. And that started back in first marriage with finger pointing. Number six, we see God judges. You can read those verses. Those excuses don't work with God. He didn't accept any of those excuses. And both the husband and wife were held accountable for their own actions, and they were both judged. Number seven, we see sin bringing loss. That's found in chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Adam lost his job. <laughs> he was caring for the garden. He didn't have a garden to care for anymore. Then he lost his home. He was driven out of the garden. He lost his two, first two children. Abel uh, was murdered, and Cain was the murderer and became a vagabond. You see, there's loss when you let sin into your marriage. doesn't mean you're going to lose your home. You might lose your home. 
You might lose your job. Who knows? You, you could lose your children. He lost all of these things that were so important. And we can lose so much if we don't deal with our sin. Let this be a warning to every married person. When we choose sin, we may lose some of God's precious blessings. And then um, letter C would be the solution uh, to problems. And through, uh, though Adam and Eve had made a mess of everything, God still showed mercy and offered forgiveness. Genesis 3.21, unto Adam and also to his, his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And of course, those coats of skin pointed to a sacrifice. Christ shed his blood to offer us forgiveness. And if we have problems in our marriage, we can go and get forgiveness from the Lord. And he's willing to extend his mercy and fix our problems. Number five, we see the preservation of marriage. It was preserved by design. Jesus referred back to the account in Genesis when he spoke in Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. Let me give you verses 7 and 8. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, so then they that are no more twain but one flesh. Now we previously looked at the word uh, cleave in the Old Testament, and now we're going to look at the Greek word for cleave in, in the book of Mark, and it means to glue. So you glue, it's like being glued together. All right, you ever see, you know, a couple driving down the road and they're like glued together? And uh, God wants the bond between husband and wife to be so strong, it's just like they were glued. When you think of Aquila, you always think of Priscilla. Why? Because they're a good example of being stuck together. They had a good marriage. And they were always mentioned together in Scripture. Adam and Eve are mentioned. And they were the first married couple, and they provide a good model for how long a marriage should last. After Christ pointed back to the Genesis account, he concluded this way in verse, chapter 10, verse 9 of Mark. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. That's how long God wants your marriage to last. He put it together. Don't break it up. In God's eyes, marriage is meant to be permanent, not an experiment. If we follow God's guidelines, we'll have a marriage that's preserved. So it's preserved by design. That's God's plan. And it's also preserved by decision. Just like Adam and Eve had to decide to love one another, they had to stay together and decide to work on their problems. Adam and Eve had problems. Yeah, they had sin in their marriage. But they stayed together, they didn't quit, and they made their marriage work. And they got through the problems. They started over. So that's what I want to do. I want to get rid of him or her, and I want to start over. No, no, they started over together. In chapter 3, verse 20, And Adam called his, name, his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And in verses 22, all the way down through chapter 4, verse 2, we, we see that they started over together. They didn't seek an, to start over with someone else. There was nobody else available, and God made it that way. And that's how you ought to look at it. There's nobody else available. God made it, and they didn't want, he didn't want them to quit on each other because they had problems. He doesn't want you to quit on each other, and like Adam and Eve, you can work through your problems. And if you're having trouble in your marriage, we can decide to change things and get back where we were. And we need to do more than just stay together. We need to be working at being one, and when we do, we'll have God's blessings in our home. A lot of lessons from the first marriage. I hope you take some of those thoughts, and you can go back and look at them. And...